So we are extremely pleased, as is evidenced by the overflowing numbers here, to welcome David Melan here from Harvard. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure many of you will be attending the CS50 hackathon tomorrow. Yes, hands up, hands up who will be attending. There you go, pretty good. So I believe there are totally 300 or so people there tomorrow. Uh, so it's going to be a hell of an event. So I'm sure you're looking forward to it. Um, so I'm not sure if many of you have looked up David's illustrious background, but he, uh, he did his uh, degrees at Harvard as well. Uh, he's now a professor there, so he's one of their most uh, legendary graduates, I'm sure. He does, in addition to all this uh, teaching at scale, he does uh, cutting-edge research in cyber security. Um, so you can look up his publication record in that area if you're interested. Uh, CS50, as I'm sure many of you know, is regularly delivered to 700 seater rooms at once. And online, I believe a million people subscribe to your online course. Which is pretty impressive, you know. It's, it's all right. It's, it's all right, you know. So, so um, with no further ado, I'll turn the stage over to David, and uh, I'm sure we're going to look forward to this. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, you know, I figured this was going to be a pretty low-key Friday afternoon talk. We'd start pretty mellow and talk about school and stuff. But with the audience here, this is great. Thought we should start a little more dramatically, which is why I was testing the lights. Uh, this is exactly as we start things in Cambridge at the start of every year. We generally with CS50's video team, our production team, put together a little sizzle video that captures some of the prior students' uh, memories and experiences in the class. Because as you'll see, one of the key tenets of CS50 at Harvard really is not just its academic backbone and not just students' experience in the classroom, but also students' experience outside of the classroom culturally and in terms of community. So if I get the buttons right, without further ado, let me give you CS50. Reach for me I'll be the one you can hold on to I miss you, I see I miss you, I believe in I miss you and me Those of you who are students, we do indeed hope you do join us tomorrow uh, at our CS50 Hackathon, first one ever, thanks to Christian Bodnar here in Manchester. Um, what I thought I'd do today is give you a sense of what CS50 itself is and how we have scaled it um, to any number of different locations, among them actually the UK. If you'd like to follow along, these slides will be at this URL and I'll put it up at the end as well. So I took over this class, CS50, at Harvard about uh, 10 years ago in 2007, and at the time it was about 20 or so years old, so this is our 30th year, but in 2007, did we really start to make a concerted effort to overhaul the course's curriculum and generally appeal to students we describe as among those less comfortable? Perhaps some of you now, perhaps some of you formerly, 
who are, might otherwise have been intimidated by the idea of taking a computer science class, let alone studying computer science in university. Um, so I'll talk to you about uh, some of the changes we've made curricularly over time, but also some of the community-oriented changes we've made and also the reach that we've had. In 2012, Harvard and MIT and then a bunch of other universities created something called edX.org, this uh, MOOC, Massive Open Online Courseware Platform, via which anyone in the world can tune in to courses from universities all around the world uh, for free. Uh, for their own edification. And CS50 happened to be the first Harvard College class that participated in edX. And for us, this was actually more of an evolution than a revolution insofar as we have been open courseware, so to speak, freely available, all of the videos, all of the PDFs, all of the assessments, all of the tools since 2007. And indeed, that's been one of the primary goals of our class has been really to lower the barrier to entry to anyone in the world who might not have the opportunity, the, the capability, uh, whether it's financially, academically, geographically, or otherwise, to come to a place like a university. Um, in 2015, meanwhile, we did a few other things that speaks too to the evolving nature of this experience for students. We now have CS50 for MBAs, uh, which is a business degree in the United States for master's students. So for specifically at Harvard's Business School, for graduate students, do we have an alternative version of CS50 that's sort of top down, whereas CS50 is very much an undergraduate bottom up class where you really do learn by doing and by building. The top down approach is more of a discussion oriented class, talking about technology, and talking about how you might use it to make more informed business decisions. Um, perhaps strangely, uh, most strangely of all, uh, did we deploy CS50 to Yale University, which if you haven't heard, is sort of Harvard's historical rival for some 200 years. Um, and thanks to our colleagues there, have we begun this multi-year collaboration whereby students at both Harvard and Yale can take one and the same class. And I'll give you a sense of what that means in just a bit. And then did we roll out that same year what we call CS50 AP, which is a high school adaptation of the same curriculum for high school teachers. Indeed, the biggest change for us in 2015 was rather than focus on open courseware as it focuses on students, making the materials available for the end user, did we begin to focus really on empowering teachers and trying to achieve more of a network effect, more of an exponentiation effect of preparing and equipping teachers to in turn teach more locally their own students all the more effectively than we could do online alone. Just to give you a sense of scale, um, as of this past year, we indeed had about 700 students at Harvard on campus, 150 students at Yale, a few uh, states away, uh, 300 students through Harvard's Extension School, which is the continuing ed program for adults. In the MBA program, this is about a 100 student class that's actually in progress right now that I teach in the spring semester. Um, CS50X through edX um, indeed has some 1 million or so registrants, not all of whom engage. Indeed, we see like all of the MOOCs um, varying degrees of engagement, but there's certainly been an interest ongoingly in CS, uh, on edX, on Coursera, and the like for some time. But more interesting there has been the realization that with edX, did we just have all the more of a reach to reach folks who might not know to pull up harvard.edu or Manchester's website or any others to look for freely available curricular resources. edX and others really put it at the forefront of people's minds. And so now do we have cohorts of CS50 students in places like Kansas City and Miami and Rhode Island and St. Louis in the US, uh, Bolivia, Burma, Chile, Netherlands, UK, in the Ukraine, um, as well and beyond. Um, and many of these are these organic communities that have sprung up because of folks like Christian taking the initiative to just organizing something locally that then mushrooms into something more, and students and faculty and nonprofits alike that have been leveraging curricular materials to better equip and better uplift folks in their own community uh, toward jobs, toward better, uh, toward higher education studies and beyond. And then in, for CS50 AP, which is now in its second year for us, do we have some 150 high schools, 5,000 students, high schoolers or college students uh, who are taking CS50 in some form and being taught um, by their own local high schools. And this is a map updated as of this morning where each of the red dots represents one of our high school uh, programs and each of the blue dots represents one of our university programs. And this is a, an evolving diagram thanks to our team members Ian and Aaron who are actually here today. Um, and this is what a typical lecture looks like, uh, at least in the first week or two of the semester. Um, I don't know if Manchester's any different, but uh, people get busy and sleepy as the weeks pass, perhaps. Um, but this was our first lecture just a couple of years ago. Um, and what we've actually adopted as an aside is much more of an asynchronous model. And so do, indeed, we have embraced the fact that we 
have neared, if not past, the point where taking CS50, at least in terms of its lectures, wherein concepts and material introduced, is a better educational experience to engage with digitally, online, whereby we pre-produce now much of the course's content, maybe just a few days prior before it ships to students, um, so that we only actually expect attendance of students um, at the beginning of the semester, at the end of the semester, but in the middle of the semester, are they welcome and encouraged to engage by watching the course's videos of lectures specifically online? Because they're supplemented, as we'll see, by any number of other in-person resources. This is a glimpse of Yale University last year at our first lecture as well, where we had a large cohort of students. And then just a quick war on tour of, of faces and places and these are some of our students in Miami-Dade in Florida in the US. Uh, these are some of our students in Chile. These are some of our students in, uh, this is in, uh, darn it, I forgot my, uh, ah, at U, damn, that's embarrassing, at UCL, <laughs> where I was yesterday. <laughs> um, sorry, there's uh, so many students we now have. Um, this is in, uh, uh, Burma here, this is in uh, Bolivia, and this is in Nicaragua as well, where we have some wonderful friends, new friends, uh, who have been leading cohorts of students themselves, essentially adopting or adapting the course's material as they see fit. It's not the sort of thing where we expect people to sort of take our syllabus and problem sets and all of that and just <coughs> teach that like automata, but rather they're welcome to pick and choose things they might want. They're welcome to use our materials to sort of teach themselves, especially at the high school level where teachers are often coming from the math department or the gym department or any number of places where their schools are asking them because they have an interest in CS, could you teach this class, but don't necessarily have the formal background themselves. It's a nice thing that we have this whole infrastructure in place via which folks can bootstrap themselves toward teaching as well. And speaking of teachers, this is our first cohort of CS50 AP teachers, high school teachers that joined us a couple of years back. And this was our first ever CS50 hackathon for high schoolers, as I was saying at lunch when a few of us chatted, at the ungodly hour of 10 a.m. Uh, for a hackathon for high school students because they had to be home by like 2 p.m. Um, so, but we had a wonderful turnout here in Manhattan in New York City with five uh, area schools in that area as well. So I thought I'd give you then a quick sense of CS50 itself, CS50 and its several other forms and speak to some of the challenges we've encountered and by all means interject at any point if you have any questions. And later on, this is not, this is really just tangential, but if you're curious as to how the curriculum at a place like Harvard compares to Manchester CS curriculum, I printed out our little flow diagram that will give you a sense of what courses we offer and in what direction if you're just kind of curious as to what else is out there, especially if you're a first year or second year. So curricularly, um, we are, I think, a fairly traditional class in introductory CS. However, it's intensive or rigorous. Um, in the US, we generally have curricula called CS1 and CS2 with that students take in their first year. Um, CS50 really is a combination of those two, all in the form of one semester, so a 12 or 14 week experience for students. Um, but we begin the semester fairly gently and fairly and deliberately accessibly with a graphical language called Scratch, if you're familiar, a drag and drop programming environment that we only spend maybe 30 minutes in class on and just a few hours on in terms of homework. But the goal, especially for those students less comfortable in the class, is to really empower them in those first hours and those first days toward just making something that doesn't even feel like programming, let alone homework, but it really is insofar as this environment has a lot of procedural constructs that we would want them to understand in a higher level language. But then we very quickly transition to a more traditional lower level language of C, where we spend most of our semester and most of the course's assignments focusing, and this is an oversimplification, but on C, and then the basis, uh, most basic of data structures and representation of memory like strings, focusing on algorithms, searching and sorting and more, and asymptotic notation and analysis thereof for efficiency. Um, issues of memory, which very quickly become most, among the most challenging for students. Pointers, if you're familiar, and memory management, and buffer overflow exploits, and things that can arise from this low level power, but low level danger as well. And then do we transition toward the end of our focus on C toward data structures, not just stopping at array but introducing linked lists and uh, trees and even tries and hash tables. And indeed, the climax of students' experience in C ends up being to implement their own spell checker um, that challenges them to implement their own hash table or try really just six or seven weeks into their experience. We then transition, and this middle part of the class changes every year uh, depending, on the, the, depending on the syllabus, but do we begin to transition from a world of command line programs to web programming, which is just all the more familiar to students and has a much higher ceiling in terms of what you can do visually and in terms of engagement. We introduced a bit of uh, machine learning this year, thanks to my colleague at Yale. 
uh, whose background is in this. And then we spend the last part of the semester introducing Python and SQL and JavaScript in the context of web programming. The goals really being to, one, give students a very modern sense of how they can apply some of these basic fundamentals to the real world and to their own interests, but also recognizing that in CS50, about 50% of our students will never take another CS or programming class again. And it's important to us that they exit from this one semester experience fully empowered to go do and solve problems in their own field, in the sciences, humanities, natural sciences, or beyond. And this over 12 weeks. So if you're curious, we have five, uh, rather eight problem sets or homework assignments, uh, one test and one quiz, and one final project, the last of which really is students' climax in the class, where they're welcome to do most anything of interest to them, any language, any tool, any application, so long as their teaching fellow or teaching assistant approves of their vision. And the problem sets themselves, a quick teaser. First one is indeed in Scratch. The second one indeed is in C. But do we very quickly start to focus on domain-specific problems, cryptography. Students implement their own cipher, Caesar and Visionaire, rotational ciphers, if you're familiar. Uh, game of 15, and, and back a few years back, did we have students, even if they were so inclined, to implement a solver for this using A star or something similar. Those, those, that was a subset only of the class. Um, forensics, we, for instance, every year go around taking photos, or these days, cutting some corners and downloading photos off of Facebook, and then pretending that they came from a digital camera, and then accidentally uh, deleting those images from the digital camera, after which we make a forensic image of the camera, just copying all the zeros and ones off of it, putting it into a file, a binary file, and then giving all students that file. And they then have to write code in C to recover all of the images. And it turns out JPEGs tend to have, with high probability, a unique signature that identifies the start and then turn the finish of a uh, JPEG. And so can you recover some 50 or more photos in this way? Way. Misspellings is our problem set where students have to implement that spell checker using a dictionary of some sort. Um, and then lastly, do we transition to Python and SQL and JavaScript? In Sentimental, do students re-implement some of their earliest programs from C, porting them to Python? And do they implement a bit of sentiment analysis? We give students a really big file of positive words, happy words, a uh, really big file of negative or angry words. And do they have to analyze, uh, if, uh, if you've heard of a certain someone, uh, someone like Donald Trump's tweets or Hillary Clinton's tweets? tweets um, a few months back when this was very much uh, in vogue. And it was interesting to see visualizations of just how positive or just how negative such folks on Twitter were. And then the last two problem sets are CS50 Finance and Mashup, the first of which integrates um, uh, Yahoo, New, uh, Yahoo Finance's uh, near-time uh, stock quote. So you can roughly, within a few minutes, figure out what the current stock price is of a company and integrate that into your own app. And students implement their own portfolio-based website, where you assign students virtual dollars. And they can buy, quote unquote, and sell stocks, and actually, in some years, compete against each other incredibly recklessly and in a very bad, short-term, uh, prioritiz uh, prioritizing way. But we do have a bit of a leaderboard, where invariably some smart student, uh, smart economic student, often uh, turns their 10000 and virtual dollars into like $1 trillion because they realize that nearly real time does not mean real time, which means you can effectively, by turning on Bloomberg or the like, see a few minutes into the future uh, and short or buy whatever it is you'd like. And then with Mashup, do we integrate a bit of JavaScript and client-side programming with Google News' uh, API and Google Maps' API and mash them together into a nice visualization, all of which builds on ideas past but gives students a much better sense of what they can do now with these basics. To give a sense of demographics, this is the enrollment trend over the past 10 plus years. Um, and things have been growing here as they have been internationally, with things kind of flatlining earlier on around the dot-com era. But in recent years, do we have six, seven, eight hundred students taking the course at a time, uh, most of them undergraduates at the college and a few cross-registered students as well. This slide here has a little more data, but the takeaways here are the, the changing blue bars. So in 2008, a year after I took over the course and started asking this question, we would ask students to bucketize themselves. Are you among those less comfortable or more comfortable or somewhere in between? And you just kind of know. If you've been programming since you were six years old, you're probably among those more comfortable. If you're not sure why you're sitting in on CS50's first lecture, you're probably among those less comfortable. So students self-identify. And within the class, do we have disparate tracks for each of those three types of students so that they have an opportunity to be around students who are similarly uh, as excited or as intimidated or as in unsure of themselves so that there's no sense of competition early on? But what's been changing per these blue bars, which capture our less comfortable students, is that they composed 34% in 2008 and are now 62% of the course's population. And so have we, over time, begun to adjust the course's support structure accordingly? And this, too, has more colors than are interesting. But what is striking, again, is these blue bars. This picture here depicts from 2007 
to 2016, the changing demographics. Whereas when I took over the class, we were largely a freshman class with maybe a first year class with 20 or so percent first years taking CS50 and a plurality of sophomores, second years, maybe 40 or 50 percent taking the class. We've become a younger class over the years, such that now we're more than half first years taking the class, uh, which has also, I think, changed the expectations of students and the background with which they're coming into the class. But there's a robust support structure. This is most of our staff this past year. Uh, we have what we call teaching fellows and course assistants, or teaching uh, TFs and CAs, almost all of whom are undergraduates themselves. So CS50 and a few of our CS classes are Harvard, are a little unique in that we do indeed leverage a largely undergraduate teaching staffs for the past 40 years. Um, and so this is an opportunity for undergrads to really get their uh, get experience uh, far earlier than they might otherwise might, teaching their peers, getting better at material, and ultimately providing the massive support structure for our 700 plus students. Students in the class have two hours of lecture once per week these days and a 90 minute section or recitation led by one of those uh, 50 plus teaching fellows pictured a moment ago, and then office hours, which are opportunities for one on one help throughout the week. Uh, whereby students can just show up to a room um, and ask questions of the week's homework assignment of the staff. In terms of the workload, in addition to the in-class time, uh, this is a plot of the average number of hours reported by students on each of our nine problem sets from left to right. So the first problem set in Scratch, as expected, takes students about six hours or so. But toward the middle of the semester, does the average begin to get around 12 or 15 hours outside of class per week? And so for a quote unquote first year class, um, which we're not per se, but we do have a majority of freshmen these days, um, it's a non-trivial time commitment even among uh, their other classes. Um, but it's not just academics that we focus on in the class. And I think we've been unusual at Harvard, if not beyond, on our focus on culture or community. And very early on, did we begin to introduce various events that were meant to draw students together in a slightly disparate context and really try to help them see the forest through, for the trees, so to speak giving them a sense of how they might solve problems more generally and also have fun with it and socialize around it. We have CS50 Puzzle Day at the start of the semester. This is an event that draws some 600 students each year. The very first week of school, we hand out a printed packet of puzzles, often written by our friends at Facebook. We're much better at writing puzzles than uh, I fear I would be. Uh, and we hand them out and give students some three hours of pizza and problem solving opportunities that have nothing to do with CS or computers or laptops, though you're welcome to use them. It really is about messaging to students in that first week that you don't need to have been programming since you were six years old to solve problems, these are meant to be representative, the kind of mindset that you'll enjoy and, be, and, uh, and hone over time. Uh, every Friday, do we take about 50 students to lunch somewhere in Harvard Square in the local city area? Uh, CS50 coding contest was new this year. We used HackerRank, if you're familiar, and ran an online competition for students if they wanted to opt into this so that they could just kind of cut their teeth online with some more challenging problems and see um, over what was essentially a break period to see how they might compete against their own classmates. The hackathon, of course, was an idea we originally borrowed from our same friends at Facebook, um, borrowing details down to the uh, meals served. So around 7 p.m. Ours is 7 p.m. typically to 7 a.m. in Cambridge. We do it at the end of our semester. And students focus on their final projects, that very open-ended uh, uh, capstone to their students' experience. Um, around 9 p.m. do we serve uh, uh, pizza? Around 1 a.m. do we serve burritos? Um, and 5 a.m. there's this popular chain that I don't know if, is at, know if it's as international as we say it is. The International House of Pancakes, or IHOP. Is that a thing here? So this is just a fraud they're perpetuating on us, apparently. Uh, so the very American IHOP serves pancakes at 5 AM. So we bring 100 or two students who are still awake at that hour and hungry uh, to congratulate them on having made it through the, the eve. And then finally is the so-called CS50 Fair. And this really was one of these game-changing things for us back in 2008. In 2007 and prior, we would present final projects in the ordinary way. Maybe 10 or 20 students would gather there in a room with the professor or with their TA and talk through their project, maybe demo some stuff, talk about things they struggled with or things they solved. And it would just no one really wanted to be there. And it was very much going through the motions of presentation. And so we drew some inspiration from what, in the US, I think of as middle school science fairs, where everyone just gathers together in one big gymnasium or room. And we brought to this friends of ours from industry, recruiters, and alumni guests, uh, music, and popcorn, and candy, and a lot of these sort of sillier flair that's really just meant to create this immersive experience for students that you saw a bit of in the video. And the goal is simply to have students present their final projects. This then is a glimpse of CS50 Puzzle Day 
and students solving problems. This is one of those CS50 lunches. This here is our CS50 hackathon when we held it down the road at Microsoft years back. Uh, this was around 4 AM that same year. Uh, this is our, one of our most recent CS50 fairs, where again, you just have a room full of students and shifts presenting their projects for the world to see. And we have some 2,000 plus students, faculty, and staff come from across campus these days um, to really just do this, look at each other's projects and take advantage of some food and some snacks and a raffle. And this is one of my favorite shots here, just clearly amazed by what his buddy uh, had pulled off. And in terms of now, Coming back to the, the evaluation of students and the feedback loops and the support and so forth, 50% um, of their grades ultimately are determined by problem sets where they spend most of their time outside of the classroom, uh, some percentage on the test and the quiz, and then 10% on the final project. And we evaluate students generally along three axes, so to speak. Correctness, does their code work as prescribed? Design, how qualitatively well written is it? Do they have 10 nested for loops, or did they do something more interesting than that? As the maybe guilty laugh here a little bit. Um, um, and then style, the sort of aesthetics. Like, does it look good? Is our variables well named? Is it indented nicely? And so forth. And some of this do we automate? Correctness is largely automated these days. Design and style is more qualitative. And indeed, that's one of the primary roles our human staff play beyond office hours and the like. And answering questions is also providing qualitative feedback for their successors. What's been interesting as an aside, we collect a huge amount of data each semester, really on a weekly basis, through surveys of students or just mining our own data sets, um, has been changing perceptions of the class. For instance, this is a plot here of the course's perceived difficulty by students, as reported by them at the end of the semester. And what you'll see that as between 2007 and 2015, per the purple bars up top, uh, that purple bar represents five, or difficult, very difficult. It was getting, it would seem, the course more and more difficult every couple of years. For instance, in 2012, we got more purple. In 2015, we got even more purple. And what was fascinating to look at was that this was no conscious decision, for instance, on my part, to sort of start racking ratcheting things up. And this seems to have been a side effect of a few things we can tell. One is perhaps the changing demographics, the class getting younger, students therefore having one less year of experience, not just in college, but perhaps even as Harvard's own socioeconomic backgrounds have been changing over time uh, for financial aid policies, embracing students who might not have had the same sort of level of rigor in their own STEM backgrounds. Do we have just different students at different points in their educational careers? And two, have we also been adding and adding and innovating, we thought, adding something new to the class each year? And it never really dawned on me that removing something from a class can be as good a design decision as adding. And so what you actually see happening as of thankfully this past year, 2016, when we really dove in deep to this data, we made a conscious effort to really remove cruft from the class. Uh, certain videos that seemed like a good idea at the time or certain pros in the course's homework assignments that seemed to be nice and uh, expository and explanatory of the material. And we really redid things. We kept the sort of overarching goals in mind, but considered what would we do if designing this course in 2016 and not 2007. And so again, did we do a sort of refresh? And what's nice to see, frankly, and relieving is that we did make a market impact on the course's perceived difficulty, whereby that purple bar, very difficult, is about half of what it once was. But we shed none of the course's workload, per se. It's the same number of programming assignments. It really is the same problems that students were implementing last year. But what we did was standardize the format of all of the homework assignments. So there's literally a TLDR, too long, didn't read, sort of summary high level overview of what to do in this homework assignment. We standardize the steps, uh, the instructions for how you test your code and how you submit your code and very simple, stupid things, but that made it feel much less onerous. And also, because in 2012 did we hop on board this, this MOOC craze, if you will, these massive open online courses in edX, where the videos, short videos, were the solution to all problems, did we flat out remove some of that content? It's just too much for a student, especially in a university environment, to absorb in his or her uh, limited week, taking multiple other classes. And so we seem to have eliminated a lot of, I think, the cruft that had built up over time. And similarly, what you can really see it in workload. This is another visualization of students' perceived workload, where purple is a lot of work, 14 or more hours per week. And indeed, do you see that these changes, among some others, uh, really made an impact on where we want students to be without actually impacting outcomes or the deliverables that students submit. Um, a topic that came up when a few of us were chatting over lunch is that of academic dishonesty, where students outright copy or cross some line of collaboration. Long story short, in CS50, students are welcome to talk through their code, but they're not meant to look at each other's screens and certainly not uh, co-write code. Um, CS50 has the largest number of detected cases of academic dishonesty at 
at Harvard most every year, except for one that made the international news a couple years back in a Gov class, as you may have heard. Um, this is not because CS students are any less honest. I think this is likely more that one, we look for it in the first place, and some courses simply don't. Two, we're very good at detecting it, and sadly, we seem to be getting better and better as our tools and as our sort of domain <laughs> expertise do. Um, but we, at, we uh, disciplined, so to speak, about 10% of the class, 70 students out of 700 this past year for crossing some line. I'm happy to chat afterward um, with anyone about those kinds of topics. So um, there's both good and bad at this sort of scale that you see. And speaking of scale, um, even larger than CS50 is so-called CS50X. Um, what we did some years ago was avoid this sort of uh, trend where everyone was creating small bite-sized video, chunking everything up, putting multiple choice questions every few minutes in the videos. And we actually preserved CS50's long form lectures. We wanted specifically for students online to have an opportunity to experience vicariously, for better or for worse, what it's like being a student at a place like Harvard in a beautiful theater um, with all of the sort of theatrics that a stage and a space like that allow us. And so we also moved away from a traditional semester. No longer are students held to uh, 12 weeks or just a few weeks. I say 52 weeks here, but we actually have some students, some of whom we saw at UCL last night, who've actually been taking CS50 at their own pace and sort of fitting in and over time out of personal curiosity over the course of two or three years, um, which isn't certainly the design goal, but has simply been a uh, realization on our part that especially with adults who have families and jobs and work and other conflicts, there's certainly um, there's no reason to sort of force synchronicity on all learners, starting at a certain date, ending at a certain date, especially if life gets in the way. And so CS50X online, the assessment model is a little different, focusing just on problem sets on the final project, no exams, but it pretty much is available 24-7, 365, um, where students can start and stop at any point. And have we really focused via our online community on these and other online communities? Rather than have our own walled garden on edX or the like or Q&A discussion forum, we've instead brought the course to where students already are. Or I say the course, but we're like, I already am. And so we have a group with 100,000 plus students in Facebook, several thousand on Reddit, um, a lot of folks on Slack as well. And through an online community of volunteers, students and staff alike, do we pretty much keep an active eye on all of these communities? And it's amazing. Even within Facebook alone, might a student post a question halfway around the world? And thanks to us, our having students in every time zone for the most part, do you get an answer? generally within minutes. It's actually quite a remarkable thing. In terms of Yale, the interesting thing there, beyond the sort of uh, drama of Harvard and Yale doing anything collaboratively, um, is that we had this curious and unusual problem of having to stand up a large course sort of on day zero with no history of undergraduate TAs, uh, no history of students having taken CS50. So whereas I benefited 10 years ago from inheriting a class that had a long tradition and structure, we had to stand this all up from scratch. And thanks to um, one of our own former TFs who went to work for Yale full time, did we stand up our own TA program. We recruited in the spring semester two years ago a group of undergraduate TAs, about 50 of them who wanted to start teaching their peers and provide that support structure. And we did we stand up, thanks to this fellow Jason, our own new training program for undergraduate TAs there who wanted to get involved in this way. And this was our first cohort of TAs. And what's most striking really is a side effect of CS50 being at Yale um, is that, and this is CS50's fair at Yale, which similarly drew a crowd of a 750 or 1,000 this past year. Um, now, of all things, as a side effect of CS50, does Yale University have, for the first time in its 200 plus year history, undergraduate TAs in other courses as well. And so this has sort of begun an interesting conversation for which there's not necessarily an obvious answer, um, but it's a nice new tradition, I think, within CS in that now undergraduates there can better support students. And it really leverages the fact of uh, the greater empathy that I think a lot of undergraduates have for their own peers, provides an opportunity for them to grow and learn and get all the better at material, and really being one of their own primary extracurricular, yet very academic experiences as well. For the MBA, class, if curious, this is the list of topics that are a little higher level by nature and by uh, semantically here. But these are really conversations in rooms not, uh, not much uh, smaller than this, where we might have 90 to 100 students in sort of a horseshoe shape really talking about these topics. I'll present them definitionally, but then we'll talk about how just under putting the so-called engineering hat on, which none of the students are uh, by trade, um, talk about, well, if you understand what a server is and a load balancer is, and maybe a little something about DNS, like how do you actually build a highly scaled 
scalable, horizontally scalable architecture? And how do you think about the costs and the human po uh, power required to build this out? And so it's more of a top-down uh, decision-making class that uses these same kind of topics. And then lastly is their CS50AP, which stands for Advanced Placement, which if I'm familiar is a program in largely the US, but abroad as well, that focuses, uh, that allows students to uh, receive essentially college-level credit for taking a college-level class if their school or university ultimately accepts it. For this, run by one of our uh, colleagues, Aaron, do we have a 36-week offering, which really is the key ingredient in adapting CS50 to all of these different demographics um, at Miami-Dade College, which is a large community college, to places like Yale, where you really have a spectrum of students and backgrounds and, and rigor and experience. Um, was it important for us to not water down the course or lower expectations? Curricularly, the courses, all of these at Yale and at X, at Harvard and AP, are uh, fundamentally the same, but the secret ingredient in some of their offerings really is that additional time. And in the high school level, do students have essentially a 36-week semester over the course of a year? And in addition to the homework assignments that their teachers are welcome to assign themselves, uh, do they have, per the college board, the entity that oversees AP courses, to performance tasks and an exam that ultimately will get submitted if they take CS50 for AP college credit? Um, this is just a laundry list of resources that we provide not only to students, but now specifically for teachers so that rather than in the future relying on the sort of Addison Wesleys and Pearsons and textbook manufacturers of the world, which have historically, at least in the US, dominated the sort of curricular offerings, we hope that places like Harvard and Manchester and UCL and Yale and MIT and Berkeley and Stanford and like all of these schools involved in these online initiatives can really become the top-down providers of K-12 opportunities and, oppor uh, and empowerment for teachers and for students alike. So we hope that this is a step toward that. In addition to the curricular things, do we literally mail uh, our teachers CS50 Puzzle Date in a box and CS50 Hackathon in a box and Fair in a box, really all that they need as a kit to deploy these kinds of opportunities for students. And then lastly, I thought I'd just give you a glimpse of some of the ingredients more technically that we use at scale that offer us these sort of opportunities to accommodate all of these students. Were it not for something called the CS50 Appliance in 2012, there's no way we could have scaled out to so many students through edX at once. Um, long story short, um, we realized in 2007 and onward that we were providing open courseware to folks online and it was a very passive experience. Like you could certainly watch the lectures, read the slides and do all of that. You could download the homework assignments and try to like solve those problems and implement those programs, but you had to figure out how to get like Clang or GCC or GDB or whatever tool chain installed on your own computer. And we didn't really provide good instructions for this because all of our Harvard students were essentially SSHing to central servers that were centrally managed that were just very easy for us to control. But did we deploy around 2009 or 10 the so-called CS50 appliance, a downloadable virtual machine, software that anyone in the world could download and install on their own machine, and then have an environment identical pretty much to what the Harvard students had? A few years later, it was working so well, we had the Harvard students start using it instead uh, as well, so we could turn off all of our centralized architecture, which comes with its own headaches as well. And then most recently, did we transition to what we call CS50 IDE, which is a pedagogical layer of sorts built on top of Cloud9, formerly a startup, now an Amazon web service, a cloud service that provides students not with a sort of sandbox toy environment in their browser, but a full-fledged code editor and file browser and terminal window and pseudo privileges all on top of an Ubuntu container or sort, uh, essentially a virtual machine. So students have full headroom to do most anything they want, not just in CS50, but any number of other environments and languages. We provide them with tools like Check50, to which I alluded earlier, Submit50, which we've increasingly stopped implementing from scratch ourselves, but building as best we can on industry standard tools so that even though we have a command that students type called submit 50, what it's really doing underneath the hood is, if familiar, is like a git add, git commit, git push to a GitHub repo to which they have write access. And even though they don't need to, especially if less comfortable, need to understand distributed version control and God forbid like merge conflicts or the like, all of which we sort of magically handle for them, when they graduate, so to speak, from CS50, have they had a bit of exposure to something they might then use in an internship that summer, even though it's not the primary focus. And with other tools like Help50 and Style50, these are more TA-inspired tools that students can use to actually um, uh, solve problems on their own. And if curious, this is just a screenshot of the environment, code editor, file browser, and uh, terminal window as well. And so lastly, um, 
we think a lot about how we characterize what it is we do. And I think if we had to boil down all of this into three terms, it would be these. Accessibility, whereby especially in 2007 did we really deliberately start to message that it is OK if you've not been programming since you were six years old. And you don't have to be a computer person to succeed in a class like this. And indeed, even in terms of the course's grading structure, percentages aside, do we really take into account the delta between day 0 and day n minus 1 when students exit the course, just how far they have come, irrespective of how they compare against their own classmates. Indeed, that's one of the reasons why we have those disparate tracks for less comfy, more comfy, and in between students alike. But we've coupled that, we hope, with a, a rigor and preserve the course's historical rigor. Because it's not all that compelling to just sort of ratchet things down, lower expectations, and call that more accessible, call that easier. We wanted students to exit the course um, having perhaps still wishing they had more hours in their, their days back, or thrilled that they now do, um, but really feel like, wow, of the 30 or so courses I might take in university, like that was one that even if I don't want to go through that again or go through that 30 times, like there were significantly high returns and it was well worth the time. And so we sort of balanced the sort of work and play of the class with that same mentality. And then the community has been important too. I think, um, Aaron, if you see someone walking around today with a shirt that says, I took CS50, that's very deliberate. Um, and indeed, this is the sort of proud stu statement that we hope students will say and feel at the end of the semester. And at the CS50 fair, do we give every one of the students something like this? And so walking around campus, each year several hundred of these shirts that sort of just say it and leave it to everyone to infer exactly what that means as to what the students' accomplishments were and uh, what they actually achieved by semester's end. Uh, you are cordially invited. The, uh, next weekend, if you would like, online to CS50X Puzzle Day, which is an adaptation of one of those on-campus classes. Uh, there's about 6,000 people registered right now, so you'll be in good company. The idea is that you can join forces with uh, two or three of your uh, university friends or family members or the like. Sign up at this URL here, and I'll leave the URL up uh, in just a moment, too. And this is just an opportunity for you to gather here on campus, in your dorms, or wherever, download a packet of problems, and spend as many hours as you might want uh, over the course of that weekend competing playfully against people from literally around the world. And we'll take a look at all of the results. We'll ship some videos where we walk you through the solutions a few days later. And it really is an opportunity to get a sense of uh, what it is to problem solve um, and to be part of this global community. And of course, this weekend, uh, thanks to Christian and Hacksock, is this event here. Hope to meet and chat with so many more of you tomorrow. Um, I'll certainly stick around now for any questions. But it's been uh, such fun to be here. So thank you for having me and the team. Okay, so I'm sure um, we're all very, very grateful for Dave for coming along. Um, do we have any questions for him? The uh, how many other courses are the students taking at the time? Three other classes, typically. Okay. Three. Sometimes students will take five total, but four is the norm each right. semester. Okay. Has there been any noticeable effect on the students majoring? Yes, it's unclear if it's causal, but it's certainly correlated with the growing um, number of students in CS50. Traditionally, we've had about 50% of students continue on to a second course in computer science at Harvard called CS51, which is a functional programming class. Um, and indeed, we have now nearly 100 majors in each class, so about 300 total across the declared uh, sophomores, juniors, and seniors, which is a market uptick from 10 years ago. Um. Um, we don't, to be honest, uh, worry too much about that in the form of the edX offering. Um, it's uh, felt to me early on like kind of a losing proposition and a massive time sink to try to do not only support students who wanted to learn on their own, but also filter in a way that uh, a credential should have. So we personally put very little weight on the certificates that edX grants. They have their verified certificates. Um, but we focus really on using the edX platform and the open courseware as an uplifting opportunity for folks um, through Harvard Extension School, which is our continuing ed program, do we have a much more intimate but more expensive, because of tuition, opportunity for students to have the support, though, of a t assigned teaching fellow, weekly feedback on his or her work, after which they emerge with actual course credit. So that's the higher touch experience. But for us, edX and the MOOC approach really is an opportunity for open courseware, not for uh, certification. Anybody else? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I teach programming for four years, and always we have the problem that how we correct the coursework or the program because each student uses it in different coding rush way. So um, I just I want to ask: Do you use a criteria for correcting these programs and problems? 
because you are using different uh, uh, languages with different tools? We do, we do. Um, how do we go about correctness testing the code? So we have our own. Currently, we have our own infrastructure called Check50 that uses a back-end system, which all the code is sandboxed, sandboxed to prevent adversarial code from exploiting the system. Um, we essentially do black box, te te uh, black box uh, testing, where for the most part, we look at standard input, standard output, and standard error. We actually hook into things at a lower level, where we actually use strace and look at the uh, control flow of a student's code. So we can also infer with high probability when they're blocking for I.O., uh, which is a lower level measure we look at. We're throwing most of that out because of the pain that it has been for maintaining it, um, especially as software uh, advances beyond our interest in keeping up with some of it. Um, and we're moving much more to uh, GitHub, which gives us all of the forms of authentication, post commit hooks, if you're familiar, and a lot of the you know, automation pieces that we want. Travis CI, which is this CI, CD, uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment service that has a, ver a free nonprofit offering for educational use. That will allow us to no longer run our own servers to sandbox students' code. We will use theirs instead. Um, and there, too, we're going to increasingly start using standard um, testing frameworks, not necessarily unit tests, because we don't want to go in and instrument students' code or complicate their experience, but to out of band test their code for correctness um, for C, Python, or any number of other languages. Web stuff gets a little harder, and we've not implemented that piece yet. Any more questions? So, is there anything in particular that they're going to be excited about uh, tomorrow that they're looking forward to? So, in addition to all gathering collaboratively and meeting each other and some of our team from Cambridge, uh, we'll hold a series of technical seminars as well. In fact, we'll send out an email later tonight with a teaser of some of those topics. Uh, food will be served. Uh, more food will be served. Um, we'll, be ha we'll have a photo booth. So, if you want to take some goofy or serious photos with your friends, we'll post all of those online. But really, it's an opportunity to work on most anything of interest to you, whether it's your own homework assignment, whether it's something CS50 specific, whether it's to chat with me or the team or get a sense of where you can go in the world and industry after CS. Happy to solve any and all of those problems, but it really is an opportunity for a fun Saturday afternoon altogether. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so if there are no more questions, I thought, I'm sure we'd all like to thank David once again, and this is a very memorable day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.